All right, let's bring in some analysis now with Tommy Sia, economist and head of Greater China Research at OCBC Bank. So, Tommy, you're hearing there as well from our correspondent in Shanghai. She lists these headwinds potentially for the Chinese economy. But these numbers this morning are coming in better than expected, whether it's retail sales, industrial production or the full year figure for economic growth. Does this for you sufficiently put to rest the concerns for the Chinese economy? How swift of a turnaround can we expect? Well, I think the market has, to some extent, are already looking beyond last year's week number, even though we have quite a decent December reading. But overall, we can conclude 2022 is quite a challenging year for China. But looking beyond, I think uh, for this year, What's interesting is I think one of the key themes uh, in China is really where I start to see the change of the wing. Just now we talk about the headwinds, we talk about the tailwind. So it seems like what could be the headwind last year could be the tailwind for this year. But what could be the tailwind last year could be the headwind for this year. So this change of the wing will be the key theme for the year 2023. But uh, overall, I think on the positive notes, we are seeing more tailwinds than the headwinds in the year 2023. So from that perspective, I would say uh, seems like there's the reason for us to be a little bit more optimistic in 2023 for China. What are some of the headwinds that are turning into tailwinds for this year? Well, I think last year there was a couple of uh, headwinds. For example, COVID is one of the key issues. So other than the COVID, we have, uh, you know, the property tightening measures. I think those seems like will potentially become the tailwind for this year because I think China's uh, exit from the zero COVID is likely to revive some kind of the economic activity uh, activities in 2023. Uh, same for the property market. I mean, for the property market, last year is quite a you know, terrible year for, for China, I think. Uh, but for the past one to two months, we are seeing quite a number of the we call the property pivot measures. Some of the measures are quite creative in my opinion. For example, China tried to link the mortgage rate for the first time buyers to the housing prices in some of the cities. So I think those may potentially become the kind of a tailwind to support the housing demand. So I think overall those changes should be positive for China for this year. So other than those things, I think uh, we are also getting slightly better sentiment in terms of the overall regulatory environment. So we are moving from the regulatory tightening to some kind of the supportive measures from the regulatory part, in particular on the tech sectors. I think those are all contributing to some kind of the positive sentiment in the beginning of 2023. Okay, and policymakers will also be keen to support this recovery, you know, to move it along, what sort of economic right. policies do you think we can expect, especially with the new cabinet? And to what extent do you think they will have to avoid overstimulating the economy? Yes, I think in terms of the policy, I think if you look at the, what has been talking about, you know, for the past uh, one to two weeks, I think the, the tone is still quite clear. China will still remain quite supportive from uh, both monetary angle as well as the fiscal angle. I think on the monetary side, it seems like, you know, as mentioned by the PBOC, I think the monetary policy this year will at least match uh, the, the some kind of the easing last year, right? So that's why there's a room for us to imagine potentially China may continue to, you know, cut the interest rate or cut the reserve requirement ratio to support the market, you know, which is in contrast to the global tightening cycle. So other than the monetary side, I think the fiscal side, China is likely to increase the fiscal deficit target this year, uh, as well as to increase the issuance of the uh, special government bond to provide a lot of support to the overall uh, economy. So I think those are the things uh, we should expect for this year. But I think to me, what's more important is really about the confidence, right? I think Everything is ready, but it's about how can you restore the confidence? How can you reboot the confidence? So this is the something the new cabinet is really going to work hard to try to revive the confidence. As long as the confidence is coming back, I think everything is ready. So as, as I mentioned, I think the policy is ready and, and all the numbers are ready. Tommy, what about long-term concerns? I mean, we are also getting China this morning releasing its official population numbers. It's the first contraction in decades. This is a significant milestone. What will this mean for the longer-term economic repercussions for the Chinese economy? 
Yes, that's uh, certainly the long-term challenge because in the end, population is a very important element for the social growth, right? So uh, for now, I think it's not that easy to turn around, to be honest. I guess... Uh, um, it's, it's kind of the a lot a lot of things need to work together, whether it being the economic measures or whether it being the social me- measures or whether it being the cultural measures. So I think those are the things we need to work together. So, but in the longer run, I think that certainly is going to have some kind of the negative impact in the long term growth potential. But on the other hand, I think the world is moving towards automation. So in terms of the population dividend, that may not as important as the as as previous decades. So what matters could be the engineer dividend. So can China, you know, move from the population dividend towards the engineer dividend to be more, you know, uh, engineering kind kind of the self engineer kind of the country? I think that is something we can watch out for in terms of the longer longer run trends. Okay. Even as you touch on the trends within the country, something we're seeing globally is, to some extent, how businesses have shifted away from China. Some are still eager to go back now. That is undoubtedly the case. But for foreign investor sentiment, some have just shifted their operations out of the country amid the lockdowns, the uncertainty over regulation. Mm. In this GDP print that you see and how it hasn't hit that ambitious target And let's also not forget how some of these wounds were self-inflicted. Do you see 2023 as being the year where, you know, investors turn back to China? Well, I think it depends. I think uh, to some extent, you know, for those short-term investors, yes, I think we might see some kind of uh, capital inflows uh, into China because I think uh, a lot of people have quite a kind of positive sentiment on China right now, which China may potentially provide some kind of the positive return in terms of the portfolio investment. But I think in the longer run, in terms of a direct investment, that's more complicated, right? Even though we can expect uh, this year could be a good year in terms of the GDP growth, maybe 5% or maybe even above 5% growth for China. But for a lot of long-term investors, they do look at a lot of things, right? Whether being, you know, geopolitical issues or whether being domestic political development. I think those are a lot of things I think the foreign investors will take into account. That's why I think, as I mentioned, uh, to me, the, this year, the key word for China is the confidence, right? It's not only the confidence for the local people, it's also the confidence for the foreign investors. So how are you able to restore the confidence to make sure, you know, you know, people think China is still the same as before, you know, China is still open for business. I think this is something to me, it's very important uh, task uh, for, for the new cabinet. But on a positive note, what, which I want to mention is that right now, China seems like a still a country can provide quite a stable return to the foreign investors. Because if you look mm. at the last year's figure, I mean, I don't have the uh, whole year numbers, but based on the you know first half year of 2022, China offered roughly about 5.5% return. So that including both direct investment and the portfolio investment. So I think mm. those to me are still very decent return. Well, if you look at the what you can get globally, probably about one to 2%. So I think to that perspective, China cons- consistently offered a higher above average return to the global investors. So that could be something, you know, uh, which could be attractive to some kind of the investors. But again, we need to make everything in order. That's the more important part uh, for the global investors. Okay. Thanks for running us through these concerns, Tommy. Tommy Sia, Economist Head of Greater China Research at OCBC Bank.